But today I want to continue my message series that I started a few weeks ago. If you remember, we were talking about uh, the Holy Spirit, and we had discussed several aspects of the Holy Spirit. We had talked about his, uh, the, the fact that there is, he has a uh, presence, that he is here with us talked about the power that the Holy Spirit has. We've talked about the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I want to talk more today, again, not just about the person and the power and the promise, but I want to talk about His presence. Uh, one of the things that, that Jesus did on the night before He was arrested, he, he sat down with His followers, His closest followers, and He said, you know... I'm going to be arrested, things are going to change, and, and they were very uncertain, and, and they weren't sure what to do, and I'm sure, like you might have been, and I certainly would have been myself, wondering, if you leave, what's going to happen next? And, and even the thought of being alone without Jesus was probably very difficult for them to understand, because they had spent so much time with him over the last three years, and he's going to leave, he says, and, and what about us? We're going to be left alone, and, and Jesus was trying to reassure them that even though you might feel alone, you're not alone. In fact, he said it this way in John chapter 14, verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans, he said. I will not leave you as orphans. You know, uh, several times my wife and I have gone on vacation and uh, left our kids with someone to care for them. And like almost every child, I believe, when, when they... Uh, are going to be left alone, or mom and dad are going to be gone, maybe even just for the evening, or, or maybe for an extended period of time. Kids left alone want to know three things. They want to know, first, where are you going? Secondly, when are you coming back? And thirdly, who's going to watch over us while you're gone? And that's kind of what this conversation Jesus is having with his closest followers is all about. And they're kind of asking, where are you going? And he's telling them, you know, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm going back to the Father. I'm going back to where I came from. Well, when are you coming back? And he says, well, nobody knows the hour of the day. I can't tell you exactly for sure when I'm going to come back. Well, who's going to watch over us? And that's when he makes the promise. This is where Jesus steps back and says, guys, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm giving someone to you. In fact, I'm going to place someone inside of you. And when you're used to being with Jesus, this might sound reassuring, but, but maybe isn't making you feel that much better. Uh, you know, they were with Jesus in moments when they felt alone, like when they were on the boat and the waves were overtaking them and they were worried they were going to sink. And so what did they do? They, they were panicked and Jesus, Jesus came to them on the water. He didn't leave them alone. He was there when they needed him. Uh, he was present when, they, when people were hungry and in need and wondering what, where, where their next meal going to come from on that day. And, and, and Jesus fed 5,000 people. He provided for them. So he's always been giving security and provision to his followers for the last three years. And I'm sure him just saying that I'm going to send someone to you probably wasn't really that comforting. But Jesus said this, John 16, 7, But verily, truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. And I said, like, what do you mean, for our good? You're leaving, that's a good thing? He says, no, it's important because something's coming. And, and yeah, I, I, I'm leaving, but it's really for your best interest. He says, unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the one we've been talking about for the last several weeks, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I will send him to you, just like he does for us. Now, how is that any better? I mean, they're probably wondering, what, what is it that makes this better? Let me say it this way. God in you is better than God with you. Maybe even more succinctly, God's presence inside of you is better than God's presence beside you. I mean, imagine being in heaven. And, you know, you kind of walk up to Moses. Moses is a, a great man of faith. A lot of people want to talk to him. I'm looking forward to that day when I can talk to him face to face. And, and I, I would want to ask him, Moses, what was it like to be in God's presence on that mountain with that burning bush and, and all that was going on? And, and what, what was that really like? 
And you know what? I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he looked at me and said, I want to know what it's like to have him inside of you. I was in his presence, but you have his presence. What's that like? Elijah. Elijah, I mean, he defeated the 400 prophets of Baal. Uh, he r- raised a boy from the dead. I, I might want to ask Elijah, okay, Elijah, what was it like to see the power of God demonstrated that way? And I can imagine Elijah looking at me today and saying, what's it like to have the power of God living in you, available to you every moment of every single day? What is that like? I think they would, would, would really like to trade shoes with us today because we have something that they've never had. They could not have experienced when they were here on this earth. And, and that's kind of... What's driving this whole series is that we understand that that we can't just learn about the Holy Spirit, but we have to encounter Him. And even though Moses knew about the Holy Spirit and Elijah knew about the Holy Spirit, they didn't ever encounter Him the the way that we do. So, when you are in the presence of the Holy Spirit, what does that do for you? Well, first I think... When you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, it, he, can, he can convict us of sin. Okay? Notice what it says in John 16, verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of God's righteousness and of coming judgment. One of the works of the Holy Spirit, one of the reasons the Holy Spirit is here with us is to convict us, to bring the realization that what we're doing is out of line with God's will, that it's hurting our relationship with Him. And He's coming so that that He can help us understand that and, and to drive us to understand that we have a need for a Savior, that we are in and of ourselves, we're going to ruin things for ourselves and, and life life will end horribly if we don't turn to him so he convicts our hearts and then he shows us that we have a need for a savior you know last time we were able to meet together we talked about the whole idea of 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 jesus sending his holy spirit to us so that you and i might understand that that this presence that he has this conviction that comes from him that that our decision to to know jesus christ That decision, well, it was because of what the Holy Spirit did, not what we have done. The Holy Spirit is the one who draws us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the opportunity to respond to him. We make a decision to follow Christ because the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. That's a Holy Spirit work. Now, I want you to think about this. During this time of confinement... I mean, people are self-isolating, people are hunkering down, or at least most people are supposed to be doing that. Sometimes when I go to Walmart, I don't think that's necessarily true. But during this time, when you're choosing to stay away from others and keep your distance, you probably feel like I feel, that my freedom's been compromised. That that this this isn't right, this isn't how it should be. And, And for us in America, we don't like our freedom taken away from us. And I know, if if you're like me, I'm waiting for that day when they lift this, this you know, self-imposed quarantine that we're supposed to be on, when, they, when this crisis has seemed to have abated and is no longer you know, affecting us in a way it's going to affect us, I know, I know I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to celebrate the first time we can all gather right back here in our church uh, and, and just spend time you know, loving on each other and worshiping together and sharing with one another like we've been doing for years and years and years. That's going to be a day of celebration. But we should be celebrating every single day the freedom that the Holy Spirit brings. Because He's at work in our lives, setting us free. When He brings us to the realization of the the sin in our life, when He convicts us, it drives us to Jesus. And when we're driven to Jesus, Jesus begins to set us free as we trust in Him, as we reveal our sin to Him, as He forgives us, as He cleanses us, as He grows us, we find true freedom. In His presence, the Holy Spirit's presence, brings about that conviction. Now, I was thinking about this. uh, Maybe, I don't know about you, but maybe you've uh, met someone in your life that, you know, when, 
when you're in their presence, somehow it seems to make you aware of things that maybe you weren't aware of before, or at least you didn't want to pay attention to. Uh, I, the way I think of it is this. I, I've, I like to go to movies. Everybody knows that about me. I'm kind of a movie-holic, and I, I just... Sometimes when you're watching a movie, you don't catch everything that's being said. And, and because you're enjoying it and, and you really want to see it, you kind of dismiss certain things that, that maybe you shouldn't dismiss. You know? But when I sit down and I watch that very same movie that I thought was kind of okay with my grandchildren, when I have Eliana and Maya and Grace sitting there, just their presence causes me to pay a lot more attention to what I'm watching and what's going on. Because... I'm hearing things that maybe I just dismissed when I was watching the movie in the theater. Or there's certain scenes that I'm going, oh, maybe that's not so good. And I'm aware that maybe I wasn't paying attention to those kinds of things. And that's kind of how it is with the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, before the Holy Spirit, we, we used to rationalize things. But now, all of a sudden, we feel uncomfortable when we rationalize those things away because we're in His presence you know, there's things that we used to laugh at that, that now we don't laugh at anymore. We, or when we begin to laugh at it, we realize that just doesn't feel right because we're in his presence. He's w- with us. Things that we used to say, hey, that's, that's no big deal. Now all of a sudden have become a really big deal because his spirit is with us and he's convicting us and he's, he's revealing himself to us and, and and it's, he, he's changing us. He's making us aware of things that maybe we didn't want to be made aware of or that we just stopped paying attention to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, notice these words. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Do you not, you, I mean, excuse me, you do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price price your body's a temple and inside that temple lives the holy spirit himself his presence residing in us here's the truth i think we need to hang on to that that when we recognize he lives in us there is no greater accountability for our lives than that because think about this for a moment when when we realize that he lives in us when he is here with us, that, that he sees what I see. I mean, he sees it. He sees what I see. He hears what I hear. And he's a witness to the things that I say. He sees things that maybe I shouldn't be looking at because he's in me. And so he sees those things alongside me. And those words maybe I ought not be listening to, he's hearing those words because he lives in me. And sometimes the words that are coming out of my mouth, he hears them because he's there with me. See, on week one, we looked at this verse, uh, Ephesians 4.30. It says, And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. What brings sorrow to the God's Holy Spirit? I think what brings sorrow to God's Holy Spirit is when He looks at our life and because of what our choices are, He begins to hurt for us because He loves us and He cares for us. It's kind of like, I mean, we all do this. I do it. I wish I didn't. Uh, I know you do it because you're just like me. But we tend to sometimes hurt the ones that we love the most, the easiest. It seems easier to hurt those that we love the most, maybe because we think that they'll forgive us or our relationship is more secure. I don't know what it is. But sometimes we do that. You know, I mean, if if we were just an acquaintance with someone, uh, you know, we might just annoy them by the things that we do. If the Holy Spirit were just like a business partner, to us, we might insult him by the things that we do. I mean, if the Holy Spirit were a distant family member, we might simply offend him by our behavior. If he were a stranger, he, he, he just might get aggravated with us. But he's none of those things. 
He's not an acquaintance. He's not a business partner. He's not a distant family member. He's not a stranger. He's the Holy Spirit, and he lives inside of us. Because he loves us and he cares for us, we hurt his heart. We hurt his heart because he's right here. I said it in week one. I'm going to say it again today. It's one thing to break a rule. It's another thing to break a heart. Well, the first thing he does is he convicts us. The second thing he can do is he confirms and affirms our salvation. I mean, the Holy Spirit doesn't come in and beat us over the head, and he doesn't come in and try to scare us into obedience. He doesn't do that to us. He doesn't use fear and guilt. He uses affirmation and confirmation to remind us who we are and who we're loved by and how much he cares for us and how much God cares for us. Romans 8.16 says it this way, For his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, joins with our spirit to affirm to confirm, to affirm that we are God's children. He reminds us whose we are. We belong to God. We are His children. See, when we're, when we're more aware of His presence, we are more confident of our salvation. When we understand that He is with us, that He's not distanced from us, that He's not hiding from us, that, that He is right here present with me, it reminds me every day that He has saved me. And I can rest in that salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Look at those words. He's a deposit. He's something that, that is placed and he has become a guarantee. A guarantee of what? A guarantee of more to come. A guarantee of our relationship with God. He is the one that reminds us always that we are God's child. He is that guarantee for us. It says he, he, we are sealed with him. And back then what a seal represented was a seal showed ownership and, and a seal guaranteed protection. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. He reminds us we are God's children and that we are protected by him because he is our seal, our seal of protection, our seal that reminds us we're his children and under his care. So he convicts us of sin, he confirms and affirms our salvation, and thirdly, he comforts us in our troubles. I think this is the one that means the most to me. I don't know about you, but this does mean so much to me. John fourteen sixteen. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another. Another what? Another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Do you see those words? Abide with you forever. He is a comforter. A comforter is someone who brings peace. He's the one that, that, that when the, the whole world is raging around you, when it seems like a storm is overwhelming you, he's the one that can allow you to curl up in the front of the boat and go to sleep. And relax, because he's there to comfort you. He can bring you a peace. The Bible calls it a peace that passes understanding. And his peace, the peace that the Holy Spirit brings to us, I, I want to tell you, it can't be explained. It has to be experienced. I don't think I could put in words, I don't think you could even do it yourself if you tried, put in words exactly what it really means to have the peace of the Holy Spirit. But when you experience it, 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 it can be overwhelming to see that God loves you that much. You may have witnessed folks who uh, have found themselves in situations that they hoped they would never find themselves in. And now that they're, they're struggling, but somehow there's this peace that has set in on them. It's not like they're being fatalistic and like, oh, there's, uh, there's nothing better to hope for. It's that they're being realistic and they know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of them and no matter what they're going through, they're going to make it through. That God's going to see them through to the end, that there's going to be victory in what they do. And when you see that in others, when you experience that in a friend or a family member or a Christian that you know that's going through a tough time, yet they just seem to be at peace 
in the midst of that storm, you might say to yourself, I don't know if I can do the same thing. I don't know if I would be able to be the same kind of person that I would be able to step back and go, oh, yeah, it's okay. It's, it, it's going to work out one way or the other. I, and have peace. It's, most of us say, I don't know if I can do that. What is it that they have that maybe you don't understand? Is that they have the same thing. They have the Holy Spirit with them, but they understand that he can give a peace and you can trust him because he is your comforter. He is the one that brings comfort to your life. You can trust in that comfort. That word paraclete, Holy Spirit, paraclete. The Greek word, it, it means comforter, someone who draws up alongside of you. It's why you can stand at the side of a casket and realize he's right there alongside you to walk you through that moment. When you're in the middle of signing divorce papers and you wonder, how did our marriage ever get to this? I can't believe this is happening. He's alongside to bring peace, to calm your heart. And maybe some of you have already begun to experience this because with the layoffs that have happened in the businesses that had to shutter for a while, many people are now unemployed and maybe it hit one of you. It's the Holy Spirit that can stand alongside of you when they hand you your, your pink slip or say, I'm sorry, I have to lay you off for a while. And you're wondering, how am I going to get through? And you can't sleep at night. It's the Holy Spirit that brings comfort so that you can. He brings comfort in the storm. He brings a peace that passes all understanding. He comes alongside. And he doesn't leave you alone. He's there with you no matter what. One thing about the Holy Spirit that I appreciate so much is that he, he doesn't just show up when it pleases him. He doesn't just show up willy-nilly. He just doesn't come around just you know, when he feels like it. He's with us all the time. You know, one of the analogies that we use for the Holy Spirit is that he is present with us like a fire. The, the Bible talks about him being like a fire. Like uh, We talked about the wind before, but he's also you know, talked about as, as a fire. And I thought about that. What does a fire do? And I mean, you ever watch those shows like, you know, survivor shows and they leave somebody on an island? What's the first thing that they want to do? They want to they find fire. They want to create fire. Why? Because fire can light your path. Fire can comfort you on a, on a cold night. Fire can be a protection from predators because when they see the fire, they run. That fire language, that fire language in Scripture is the same kind of tr truth for us that, that the Holy Spirit is like a fire who can light our path. He can show us where to go. He's a comfort on those cold nights. He is that peace that passes all understanding. And He's our protection. He reminds us whose we are and who is watching out over us because He is inside of us. He, he, he brings that warmth that we need. But we're warned in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Now, quench isn't a word we use very often, so there was another translation. The International Standard Version said it this way, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Don't pour water on it. There's a flame there. Don't pour water on it. Don't put it out. But there is something sometimes about the way that we live that can stifle what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. If that's the case, I want to challenge all of us as a church. Find out what that is in your life. What is it in your life that is putting out the fire, keeping it from blazing in your life? I would suggest that for many of us, it is 
living a distant and kind of distracted life. I mean, there's a lot going on. This last week, it was crazy. I mean, I've been going over here and going over there in my head and trying to take care of things here and trying to get set up so we can do this kind of, uh, of cast with you guys and all that that really means and, and still trying to meet people's needs and answering phone calls and counseling over the phone instead of in person. And you get so distracted that you don't even have moments to spend with him. So life gets in the way. I think that stifles what he can do in our life. What we need to do is we need to start carving out time in our schedule. I, I love it that Doris spends every morning carving out time to be with God, listen to his, his spirit, to, to just absorb what God wants to say to her through, through his Holy Spirit during those moments. We need, to, we need to make time to connect with God. I want to encourage you to do that. Now, something that happened to me last week, uh, I have a, a lovely little cat. <laughs> she's, a, she's a Russian blue. She's a little sweetheart, and you guys know I'm a cat lover. And I, I don't like her to get out because she's not an outside cat. And, and the other day, she snuck out. And I just noticed something, that as I tried to catch her, every time I got near just where I thought was I was going to be able to grab her, she would run off. And you've probably experienced that yourself, you know. Cat comes in. You get close, they look at you like, yeah, no way, that's not happening, you're not getting me, and they take off. And she would do that over and over and over again and kept getting further and further away, and I kept trying to come around her and direct her back to the house so I could catch her. And Dora finally comes out and says, John, relax. Just come on in the house, sit down, she'll come back. And my mind says, no, 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 i got to catch her, i got to get this because this is precious to me, I want her, I don't want anything happening to her. And Dora says, no, you just got to relax. Just sit down and relax. So it's kind of like what it is with us. Sometimes we want to go out there with the Holy Spirit, and we want to seize, we want to grab, we want to try to capture the stuff that he has given us, the fruit of the Spirit. Like, I, I'm going to have joy no matter what, and I'm going to seize that joy, and I'm going to have it, and then it's not there. Or, or, or you're going to say to yourself, I, I, I'm going to be patient in this situation, and I'm going to hold on because I'm supposed to be patient. I want to be patient, and the more you try to be patient, the less patient you become. As we reach out and try to grab, and it seems to get a little further away and a little further away every time we go for it. We need to do what happened to me with my cat. Sure enough, just a minute or two after I gave up chasing her, I sat down at the coffee table in the kitchen with the back door open, and in she came. Came right to me. Why? Because the more you try to seize the cat, the more you try to seize the fruit of the Spirit, the more elusive it becomes. But when you get still, that's when he comes. When you get still, that's when the Spirit begins to, to release the peace in you that you want to find. See, the Holy Spirit is not seized. The Holy Spirit is received. You got to be still. You got to have some margin. It's kind of like putting up the sail. And when you put up the sail, you got to put up the sail before you can receive the wind. And you just got to relax until the wind comes. See, the secret is not that you get more and more of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit gets more and more of you. And one of the ways we can stifle that in our lives is with unbelief and unresponsiveness. When, we, when the Holy Spirit comes to us and he asks us to do something, we pray for God to do something, and then we don't listen to what he has to say, or we don't really believe he cares. I, I think what we need to do right now is begin to pray, Lord, help me to believe the promise you made to me about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to believe that it is true, that it is real. And when you do that, when you begin to believe, when he leads you, respond. When he guides you a certain direction, don't fight and say, maybe later I'll get to that. You say, no, I'm going where you want me to go now. The more responsive you get, the closer and deeper the relationship. 
Acts chapter 7, verse 51 says, You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did. And so do you. You could have been a part of it. Okay? Stephen is talking here to a group of people who, who didn't want anything to do with, the, with God, didn't want the Spirit in their life, didn't want to experience all of that. And, and in his defense, this is what Stephen is saying. You could be a part of it, but because your hearts were hardened, because you resisted the Holy Spirit, you're going to miss all of it because you're stubborn. You're unresponsive. You don't believe. And what did they do for him? They stoned him. Put him to death for his faith. Little did they know that that released him into a life that was much better. And Stephen, because of the peace of the Holy Spirit in him, could withstand that moment. Because he did do what he was asked to do. He did respond when he was called to do something. He did trust in the promise that the Holy Spirit was inside of him. So when his moment came, he was able to get through. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Every time you hear and say maybe later, the more hardened your heart becomes. The more quickly and the more often you respond, the softer your heart becomes. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I just want to share some thoughts with you that I hope will always be true for our church. May we never, as individuals or the church, stifle the Holy Spirit. May we never bind the Holy Spirit with administrative red tape. May we never restrict the Holy Spirit to the boundaries of our comfort zones. May we never tie up the Holy Spirit with our traditions. May we never limit the Holy Spirit with our personal preferences. May we never squelch the Holy Spirit with our secret sin. May we never stifle the Holy Spirit with our self-help approaches to life. May we never inhibit Him with our inhibitions. May we never constrain him with our constraints on the way we, what we call planning. May we never let human stuff get in the way of the Holy Spirit. And may we never confine the Holy Spirit to a building. Guys, he's with you where you are. The church is still here even though we're not in a building together. We are still here together. So here's my advice as we end this series. Don't seek his presence. Experience it. And so here's what I'd like you to do. I know you're at home, wherever you're at. I'd just like you to repeat a couple things with me. I want you to say this to yourself. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life. Let's just say that together. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life. And and maybe we need to say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in our church. So let's say those two things together. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in our church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your spirit that you did not leave us alone. Thank you that when Jesus, when Jesus died, that wasn't the end. It was the beginning of an even more intimate and deeper relationship as your promised Holy Spirit is with us today. God, may we today, especially in a moment when we feel so distant from each other, be reminded that the same Holy Spirit that's in me is in in every person that's watching right now. Everyone who calls themselves a Christian who who is saved because of what the Holy Spirit's work has done in their life, we are united by one Spirit. Maybe not in one place, but in one spirit. We want to give you thanks for that. Father, we want to thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit. We want to thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. 
especially today, want to thank you for his presence. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, it's been an interesting week. Never done it like this before, but I want to say thank you for spending time with us today. So as we just close with a song, I just want to encourage you. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and take you places you could never have imagined. See you next week.